Welcome to The Drawdown, a podcast by Cherry Beckert's private equity practice. In each episode, we explore the latest trends in the private equity sector, as well as challenges and opportunities in the ever-changing investment environment. I am Cameron Smith with Cherry Beckert. Today, we are pleased to present to you part two of our multi-part series on special purpose acquisition companies, or SPACs, also known as blank check companies. The series is called SPACs, the players in the paper, because we will be sharing various perspectives from the advisors who are key to closing deals for both the SPAC and the company taking the investment. In part one, we were joined by Chase Wright, one of our partners leading the charge on accounting do's and don'ts when considering a SPAC transaction. Today, I'm pleased to be joined by Scott Moss, Cherry Becker partner and leader of the firm's private equity and deal advisory practice. Scott, welcome to the drawdown. Thank you, Cameron. Thanks for having me. Both Scott and I are extremely pleased to be joined by Andy Tucker, an M&A partner at Nelson Mullins who has significant legal experience advising SPACs throughout the entire business cycle, from formation and capital raise through the IPO process and their initial business combination. Andy, welcome to the drawdown as well. Cameron, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Scott and Andy will be discussing the current state of the SPAC market, the impact of recent SEC regulatory guidance, and what may be in store for the SPAC sector moving forward. Andy. Thanks again for joining us. Let's maybe just start with an update on the SPAC market overall. A year ago, SPACs were all the rage. It was every uh, business article and and news segment about business seemed to focus on SPACs and SPAC activity. How's that changed in the past 12 months? Well, I think, um, Scott, the the market has changed dramatically in the last 12 months. realistically dramatically over the last six months. I mean, at the start of 2021, we were, the SPAC industry was pricing, you know, almost five deals a day, which was probably an unsustainable pace. Uh, And everybody was coming to the SPAC market. We even had, we had the Shaq SPAC, Um, Shaquille O'Neal was a sponsor of a SPAC, um, among other celebrities. uh, Paul Ryan uh, had one, a few other people. Uh, And now, um, you know, in April, and we'll come to this kind of in some of the SEC discussions, there was a change that hit the SPAC market in terms of the accounting for the warrants that are part of a SPAC. And for those who don't know, a SPAC raises money by selling units, which are a combination of a share of common stock, some fraction to a whole warrant, and occasionally rights to per, to receive additional shares of um, of common stock in the SPAC. And the SEC kind of in April came out with some guidance that changed the accounting treatment for the warrants. And that really put the market on pause for probably a good solid month to six weeks. There were still a few deals getting done, um, but not too many as people wrestled with the issue that the SEC presented. I think now, when looking back over the last couple of weeks, the market's still pricing about a deal, you know, a little bit more than a deal a day. Or, you know, so we're pricing, you know, five, you know, to six deals a week. Um, that still is a pretty uh, fast pace compared to where SPACs were historically before they blew up about a year ago in terms of number of deals. Um, But, you know, well off its pace and arguably a a more sustainable pace um, for the market as a whole. That's great. So still still a fair amount of activity, you know, even doing uh, pricing on a deal a day, five to six in a week. Um, are you seeing any particular sectors that are particularly attractive to SPAC investors? Um, you know, the SPACs that are doing the best in terms of pricing terms in the market are, you know, healthcare is still very active. You know, so SPACs focusing on healthcare, I would say probably more healthcare IT related, you know, telemedicine. 
um, data analysis, data analytics, artificial intelligence around healthcare, as opposed to pharma pharmaceutical or those types of things. I would say AI generally, artificial intelligence generally, is still very big. Um, I would say what's fallen off um, dramatically is uh, Chinese focused SPACs. Um, that's probably coincidental with the SEC's tightening of guidance for IPOs from China. Um, we've had a couple China sponsored SPACs, or more accurately, Hong Kong based SPACs um, sponsored by Chinese individuals. And the SEC has taken to asking either for a number of risk factors on China or a commitment that you won't be investing in a company based in China or Hong Kong. Um, I think we're still seeing a lot in renewables, um, very still renewable energy type transactions. Um, the infrastructure now more about around electric vehicles as opposed to electric vehicles themselves. And then I would say, um, you know, there is a general spread around a number of other transactions, but those are probably the ones that are doing getting the most attention and having the easiest time coming out in terms of raising money for their SPAC. That's, that's great information. You know, we're, we're in a period of just unprecedented M&A activity and, and probably private equity funds themselves are set to have a record year, uh, both in the standpoint of fundraising and the amount of capital they're deploying and number of deals that they're getting done. How does the size factor impact SPACs, both in terms of their ability to raise their, their funding and, and, and achieve their capital um, uh, growth goals, but then also in terms of actually deploying that capital and getting getting deals done. Um, it, is it a movement towards bigger is better, or is there still an opportunity for maybe some smaller size SPACs to play in the marketplace? Um, I think the deals we're seeing getting done right now are more, quite frankly, the smaller size SPACs, um, you know, $100 million, $150 million, even um, kind of the new floor on SPACs of $75 million, um, they're m more likely to be getting done right now than the big, you know, $300, $400 million SPACs. Not that those aren't getting done, but as the market has turned, kind of pricing has shifted on SPACs. And there are a couple of price points in, in SPACs you know, unlike a regular IPO, everybody understands, oh, you're pricing at 15 to 17 and, you know, you're now priced at 1550. So, you know, where roughly how you did all SPACs price at $10 a, a unit. And so the question really becomes then the economics around it are, are what influences pricing. The main thing is what goes into the trust in April at the peak of right before the, you know, the SEC announced its change. All SPACs were pricing and holding in trust 100 cents on the dollar or $10 a, a share for the common to fund potential redemptions if the SPAC couldn't get done. In the lower end of the market, as the market came back um, and inflation started to come up as well, that started to shift. And, you know, we started to see deals getting done at, you know, one, one hundred and a half and then 101. And now 101 and a half is pretty standard. Um, in the smaller market, the warrants that were part of the transaction were always at roughly a half a warrant in the smaller size of the market. In the larger market or for more experienced SPAC teams, you know, a, or, a, or a private equity fund that was sponsoring a SPAC, you would see the warrant at, you know, a quarter or maybe even a fifth of a warrant um, and less experienced teams were at a half. Now I would say that the um, most of the deals we're doing at least are at a full warrant. And so the pricing has definitely changed. Um, now the other part is how long the SPAC has 
to um, deploy its capital. And in April, you know, a very, you know, a, the private equity funds are very active repeat SPAC, op, SPAC operators could have a full two years to find their business combination. Most people are at 18 months. Now that's kind of shifted down and it's basically 12 months with a couple of automatic extensions as long as the sponsor puts um, an extra 10 cents a share into the trust for redemptions to cover, you know, if they don't get their deal done in 15 months or 18 months, instead of getting $10 a share back, the investors would get 1010 or 1020, depending on how long the um, sponsor paid for. What that's done is those terms have kind of driven out, uh, for lack of a better phrase, although it's more that the the more experienced SPAC sponsors have not wanted to pay that price to get their deal done with the result as you know, we talked about just briefly is that a lot of the smaller deals are still getting done. Um, but the bigger ones, rather than getting that, I would not say they're failing on getting done. They're just choosing not to embrace the market terms and are not going to the market. That makes sense. In the past 12 months, even though we've got still historically low interest rates, we've started to see some um, fairly dramatic changes in, in some economic pressures within the economy as it relates to inflation. And then certainly um, here lately, there's been a lot of discussion around changes in tax laws. Um, how's the broader economic pressures impacting the SPAC, uh, the SPAC market and their process on getting deals done? Well, I think, you know, there are a couple of things. One, I do think part of the driver on the move from 100%, 100 cents on the dollar in trust to, you know, 101 and a half um, in trust is driven by inflation expectations in that, you know, when interest rates are near zero, investors are willing to give you know, SPACs, you know, essentially lend SPAC sponsors the, their money in return for the equity upside and the warrant as their return on their capital, as they can get alternative investments that are at a higher interest rate, you know, that, that, is, dry, that is clearly driving a portion of the increase in the um, amount that goes into trust. Um, as for how it's affecting the DSPAC market, um, I think there is some pressure on on that. I mean, I think there is some asset inflation that's kind of driving uh, driving that. And I think there is just a recognition that you need to get your deal done um, sooner rather than later in this market, or else you know, or else the investors in the SPAC are out the you know three and a half or four percent of the amount of money that they've raised. They they just lose it, and so there is a real incentive to get a deal, a transaction done, and so especially towards the end of the SPAC life cycle, um, it's interesting to watch some of the SPACs move around and you know take deals that you know are probably you know still good deals, but are not the perfect deal. Right. But you had touched on briefly um, the SEC guidance that was issued in April uh, regarding the warrants. Um, do you think that that um, guidance is now fully incorporated and reflected in the market, or are some of the SPACs still wrestling with that issue? And how has that um, potentially impacted things here in this year? Well, I mean, just for the benefit of the listeners, the change on the warrants, the, there was a difference between the public warrant and the private warrant. Um, the sponsors buy the same units that the public does. The sponsors' warrants, however, were not subject to the redemption that the public warrants had. The public warrants, the SPAC or the target company post SPAC, if the price trades up to either 18 or 16, 18 dollars or 1650 for a certain period of time, the SPAC gets to call the warrants, well, the target company gets to call the warrants in for a penny.
basically force their exercise so that they don't they either get the cash or the they get rid of the warrants the sponsor warrants were not subject to that redemption and the sec and at the behest of some in the accounting industry reevaluated the the way SPACs were treating that and said that that really needs to be treated as a liability on the SPACs books, which then transfers as a liability to the company's books. And while it's a non-cash charge, it's, you know, causes some up and down in your stock price going forward and your income as the target in the SPAC. To the SPAC itself, it really makes no difference. It's really how it affects the target. And I would say, you know, the industry spent many weeks arguing with the SEC over that. Ultimately, the SEC did not change their position their, or did not revert their position, shall we say, back to the way that had been done for years. And so SPACs had to adjust. And there were, you know, two ways you could do it keep doing it and get liability treatment, which affects your D SPAC, or take away the rights from the sponsor to, and subject their warrants to the same redemption. I would say almost every, if not every deal done since the SEC, you know, stopped negotiating, for lack of a better term, on the issue um, has been done with modified warrants to take equity treatment. Um, there are a few older SPACs that are out there in the market still that are now under liability treatment. It does not seem to be having a big effect on their ability to get a D SPAC done. I think. There are so many non-cash charges that people or investors are used to backing out that I don't know that it makes that big a difference. Um, and you know the increased cost and inconvenience of it, you know, on a to a billion dollar post spac company isn't that dramatic a number. Um, so I don't know that it's really had that much of an effect on the market. You know, the second accounting guidance that came out probably about a month ago, um, maybe six weeks now, um, what had to do with the redemption um, treatment of the stock for redemption. And that's had a more significant effect on the market, but one that the market's also adjusted to. And basically there, um, the account, the all of the shares in the SPAC are subject to redemption if they're, if the investors don't like the um, business combination that's presented. And for, you know, as long as there's been a SPAC, there'd been a limitation that if, you know, on just for the sake of the math, if it was a hundred million dollar SPAC, if 95% redeemed so that if you were to have a net asset value on net tangible assets, rather under $5 million and a dollar, you would basically cancel your deal and not redeem the shares. And so SPACs for years have been treating that $5 million as permanent equity as opposed to temporary equity. And that accomplished two things. One, net tangible, the net tangible assets were, there are two ways a blank, a, a SPAC avoids becoming a penny stock and subject to a host of other regulations. One was to have net tangible assets over 5 million and the other was to list on a national securities exchange, either NASDAQ or New York Stock Exchange, either the capital markets or American or a higher market if you could. Um, but generally, nobody did. They stayed on the smaller one, both for cost and, and some other related reasons. Um, and so the SEC looked at it and said, well, you know, when you really think about it, every share is redeemable and so you don't know which share is actually going to be redeemed and yes notwithstanding your limitation therefore we think all hundred million should be treated as temporary equity so temporary act the change in temporary equity again very little change in the SPAC document itself when we started flipping them the ones that we were in process on the work to change it was very minor however what it did do is it left us with only one way to avoid being a penny stock listing on either the New York Stock Exchange or um, NASDAQ. Now, the problem is the smaller exchange, NASDAQ, Ameri NASDAQ 
Capital or New York Stock Exchange American, all of the listing standards require $5 million of, of um, net tangible assets. And so now, note in the SPACs make that number. And so that meant you now had to figure out a different way on. And for both New NASDAQ Global and New York Stock Exchange, you can get on as long as without a net tangible asset requirement, as long as you have a initial market cap of $75 million. And so that trend, that change basically wiped out every SPAC that was in process that wanted to only do a $50 million transaction because they could no longer qualify for NASDAQ or, or New York Stock Exchange and thus would be a penny stock and the parade of horribles would follow from that, not the least of which is nobody would buy if they couldn't find you on a, on a stock exchange. Um, the, the legal parade of horribles, nobody really wants to hear. So we'll just go with nobody <laughs> would buy the stock. And so, you know, we had one deal that was in process and over the weekend, the founders had to go and raise enough capital to cover the increase in the deal size from 50 million to 75 million. And you know, we had another deal that wanted to be 50 million and we told them that doesn't work anymore. And they too raised enough money to get to 75 million. Um, but it's, you know, that is, that's kind of, I think, a permanent change is that we will no longer see, you know, $50 million SPACs. And what that means on the back end is typically for the economics of a SPAC to work for the sponsors, the SPAC generally buys a company as low as three, but usually you'd shoot for that five to seven range multiple of the amount of capital you have in the SPAC. So, you know, a $50 million SPAC would look to buy a 250 to, you know, 300-ish, 350 million company. You know, a $500 million SPAC would be looking for a $2.5 billion company. Um, and obviously that's now shifted up. So some of the smaller companies that might have thought they were a good target for a SPAC probably no, aren't as, as good a target as they once were. And, you know, that may make them a better target for a private equity transaction, may make them a better target for a more traditional IPO. Thanks for those insights. So we're sitting here in the very early part of the fourth quarter. Uh, we're already starting to see a number of uh, predictions on what 2022 might look like, both from an M&A perspective and just overall uh, capital raising perspective. Um, any thoughts on what the SPAC world might be um, might be looking forward to in 2022 and what it might look like? Well, you know, I, I guess to take it from two directions, one, the new issuance market, and then second, the kind of the DSPAC market. I think on the new issuance market, I think the market is going to you know, barring a, you know, rapid rise in inflation um, or any, you know, new changes at the SEC, I think that the new issue market will kind of stay focused in that 100, 150, 200 million dollar range as, you know, a private equity fund has other ways of getting returns and the bigger money says, you know, maybe we'll we don't really, you know, a $500 million deal putting in, in a $500 million deal, putting an extra 1% in trust is, you know, $5 million you've got to find to as to a sponsor group. And that might be more risk than some sponsor groups want to obtain, especially when you look at the multiple on the other end and think really how many, you know, three and a half, you know, triple unicorns are there out there for them to buy. Um, you know, the advantage of being a $100 million SPAC is there are a lot more targets in that three to $500 million range. So I think we'll still continue to see those smaller SPACs go. And if I'm just judging by my, if I take my phone as a microcosm of the whole market, I am still getting a lot of calls for a $100 million um, SPACs, um, you know, one or two a week. And so, you know, we're Still, there's still people are still gearing up. I think on the D SPAC market, you know, as long as SPACs keep coming, the D SPAC market will go. 
I think we have, you know, a kind of a pig in a snake scenario right now in the DSPAC market and that there are a lot of deals that have to get, there are a lot of SPAC sponsors that will not want to return capital and will be doing deals. And I think we've seen some of that, you know, redemptions in the SPAC market have definitely ticked up, um, you know, over in, in the April, May timeframe, June timeframe redemptions generally hovered in that 30 ish percent range of the trust. And every now and again, you'd see one a little higher every now and again, a little lower, but you could generally count on about a 30 percent redemption rate. Now that number has really ticked up to about half would be kind of norm. You know, we've seen, you know, numbers come in in the 70s. We've actually even seen a couple come in in the 90s. And, you know, what's driving that I think the deals that are not getting done or are getting hit with very high redemption rates are deals where first the stock doesn't move much off of the ten dollars. So from an investor's point of view, ten dollars in hand is better than the upside from the equity, and they, they don't just discount the warrant, um, or is even trading below the ten dollars a share. But if you're going to hold the stock at nine and you can get 10 in cash for it. You're going to trade the cat, get the cash. The others I think that have been hit are companies that were earlier stage and, you know, maybe pre-revenue um, unsettled business plans that, you know, much like kind of the end of the tech bubble or any kind of market cycle, you kind of wonder what they're doing here. Um, those types of companies were coming through. Um, and I think that's had um, an effect. And then I think some of the transactions were just so wildly priced that, um, you know, people were looking at these companies and saying, you know, it's not a six billion dollar company. Um, you know, we've had you know numerous SPACs for electric vehicle companies, for companies that don't even have a vehicle on the road and aren't in danger of having one on the road. Um, and they were getting valuations in excess of Ford Motor Company. Um, and I think the redemptions have kind of imposed a certain market discipline on it. And the DSPAC transactions we're involved with um, are all, I would say, much, much more solid and less bubble-like businesses than um, some of those others. And you know, you know, part of that may be that we play in the smaller end and so, you know, we're not getting these kind of $3 billion business plan type companies. But, um, you know, the ones, you know, the DSPACs that we have in process, the companies are all very good, very solid companies. And so um, I think we'll, I don't think we'll get hit with those upper end of redemptions and we'll get those deals done. So it sounds like continued momentum here into 2022 for sure. Yeah, I mean, I think the I think the the backlog of SPACs looking for M and A transactions will keep the momentum going at least until mid twenty twenty two, and then it will depend on the strength of the new issue market, how far into twenty twenty three that key or twenty late twenty twenty two and early twenty twenty three how that looks. Personally, right. I think the SPAC market has become enough well enough respected as an means of going public that we won't have the complete shutdowns that we had historically in that market. Right. So really, it sounds like, you know, the SPAC market has been around for a while, um, certainly experienced uh, some very positive momentum in 2021. And while the activity may have slowed somewhat, um, SPACs still have a significant amount of capital to deploy. And they probably solidified their position in the overall M&A markets um, and are positioned well for the foreseeable future to continue to be a player uh, in doing the acquisitions and teaming with business owners that are looking to, to partner in a process that ultimately gets their business into the public markets. Um, there's certainly a lot to consider for SPACs and for business owners looking to team up with SPACs to complete a transaction. I think you've done a great job in highlighting the importance of having competent and knowledgeable advisors in every step of the process, whether that's on the accounting side, the tax side, the valuation side, and certainly the legal side. 
So thanks for joining us today and providing these valuable insights to us and our listeners. Um, we really appreciate your time. It was my pleasure to be with you, Scott, and it's always great to work with Cherry Beckert and uh, partner with great people. Thanks very much. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Drawdown. For more information on SPACs, or if you have any questions about this episode, we encourage you to contact us at SPAC at cbh.com or find us on our website or social media channels. Until next time, take care. Thank you for listening to The Drawdown, Cherry Beckert's private equity podcast. The views presented by our guests do not necessarily represent the views of their respective firms. For more information on how Cherry Beckert serves as a guide forward to private equity funds and their portfolio companies through accounting, tax, and advisory services, please visit cbh.com.